Welcome to the Spiritually Incorrect Podcast with me, your host, Shiv Sengupta. I'm the author of the Advaita Holics Anonymous books, Sobering Insights for Spiritual Addicts, A Manifesto for Spiritual Anarchy, and the newly released An Antidote to Spiritual Enlightenment. Today, my guest is someone uh, whose work I deeply respect. His name is Robert Saltzman. Welcome, Robert. Oh, thank you so much, Jim. It's a pleasure to uh, be with you again. I recall that we did this, I think it was back in 2020 when you first came out with the uh, Vita Hall first book. And um, I uh, Catherine Noyce, your publisher and mine, had sent me a PDF to review before that interview, but I never got around to reading much of it at the time. Subsequently, I have read it, and it's it's really a wonderful book. I recommend it highly to anyone who feels addicted or troubled by um, searching for uh, the end of the rainbow. So, so let's speak about that. A little bit this idea of spiritual addiction it's it's not a very common theme not many people are aware that you know an addiction to spirituality is even possible most would deny that they're spiritual addicts but i mean you have written extensively about it yourself in your books and you've pointed at it quite a bit because it seems to be an underlying theme of what feeds this industry of hope and and enlightenment so what let's let's rewind back a little bit. What what got you into writing about the themes that you do, as opposed to kind of getting on the same bandwagon as everybody else is making a buck doing this? Um, yes. Well, um, many years ago, well, I've been living in this little town here in, in uh, southern Baja California, Mexico, and uh, pretty much on my own in. Um, my studies of, of Buddhism, which I was interested in. And then a rather renowned Buddhist teacher moved to town here. And uh, we became friends immediately and we began to meet uh, weekly or so with the intention of discussing this understanding of Buddhism. And he also had a Sunday uh, Sangha where he would speak on Buddhist practice and meditation and all of this. Well, after several years of this, um, he told me that he thought I was a teacher of non-duality and he would like to send some of the people from his Sangha to speak with me. And I resisted that idea for several years, but he was tricky. And eventually I agreed to see some of his people. And I had a psychotherapy practice at the time. Um, and these people would come to my consultorio, but not for psychotherapy, purportedly for spiritual awakening. And I never felt totally good about it. Um, and after about a year or so, I decided that I needed to get out of that and I, that role, and I did. Um, there was a conflict between my work as a psychotherapist and the role of a spiritual teacher because um, as a psychotherapist, the idea is to bring someone to greater awareness of the ordinary personality with which that person must face life in the world. Spirituality, on the other hand, can be used to bypass that task, as John Gray called it, spiritual bypass, 
And in that sense, it's no different from any other way of avoiding the question of who am I and how do I function, such as drug addiction, uh, sexual addiction, overeating, excessive anything, excessive TV. And um, when I began to bring that idea into the public, which I did at the behest of John Troy, who had interviewed me on the radio and then got me involved in Facebook. Um, I received a tremendous amount of pushback. Many people were insulted by this and some threatened by it. And of course, when I was faced with that, I had to deal with a lot of pushback. And interestingly, I see that you're getting the same kind of thing now. Um, it's It's been amusing to me to to watch you taking the same kind of bashing that I received when I tried to speak about these issues honestly. But anyway, that's the story. I got into this because I care about mental health. And I think that most spirituality is a hiding place for neurotic people who use it to avoid dealing with the ordinary life that we all must lead. That's about it. And, and I think that's a key point when you say most spirituality is about um, really spiritual bypassing, using these tools, techniques, philosophies to bypass uh, the, the personality, the problematic personality with its suffering and challenges and all of that. Uh, but in your mind, is there a kernel of spirituality or truth in there? that does open up a human being to life more profoundly. And I, I, I know you've spoken about it in your books to a large extent. I do as well in my books. And from my perspective, that is truly what spirituality is supposed to be about, not bypassing any of the suffering. In fact, it's not about suffering at all, but really getting down to that kernel of truth that lies at the heart of everyone's experience. And I feel that psychotherapy in a way misses that because it's so hyper-focused on personality. And then spirituality or the culture of it, as you pointed out, bypasses the personality and tries to make it all about this experience of non-personality, non-being, whatever you want to call it, right? And a, a no-doer uh, experience. And there seems to be a gap on both sides. There seems to be some vital link missing between the two fields. And it's always something that I myself in my work I'm trying to get, is a gap I'm trying to bridge. And I feel you are as well when you write. So I wonder if you could speak a bit more to that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, is there a, a kernel of, of truth in spirituality? Sure, but it, of course, it's buried under a tremendous amount of dogma and um, also has become a commercial enterprise for a lot of people, which is not a really good uh, resting place for truth because a lot of truths are hard to hear. And if I speak them, um, I may alienate a lot of my followers who have been paying me. They, they aren't paying me, but in, in, I'm speaking in general. Um, so that's a tricky question. Um, when you asked me to do this podcast, I hadn't seen one of your podcasts. So I, I uh, watched the one that you had with Paul Hederman. And he's an honest person without a big ax to grind. I enjoyed hearing what he had to say. But on the other hand, he talks about satsang and truth a lot and claims that he has a way of leading someone to that truth. And that's an idea that I totally reject. I don't believe in any capital T truth that human beings have access to. We're living in a material world and there's no denying that without becoming deluded. deluded. And so, one of the things that I push back against is the idea that there are teachers who can lead you to truth. I don't believe that. That said, is there a kernel of, of interest, let's say, not truth, but is there something interesting in um, spirituality 
as a field? Well, of course, because we have spiritual needs as people. We need love, we need compassion. We need to understand our position, not just as animals in a material world, although that's the basis for what we are, but the other needs that we have for meaning and love and, and uh, compassion. And there are ways in spiritual practice, well, practice is not the right word. There's an understanding that one can come to about who and what I am that won't be true because it's personal. There's not one overarching truth about what, what is a human being after all. A scientist will see it from one point of view and a priest from another entirely. So I would not say there's truth, but we can come to an understanding of our situation, our human situation. And I think the best parts of spirituality have done that. I think that Zen Buddhism, for example, is a very interesting field, worth reading about, worth finding out about. Uh, Advaita Vedanta, not so much. I'm a pretty harsh critic of that particular uh, end of it. But um, that's a long answer. I'm sorry I've carried on so long. But to answer your question, sure, I don't, I don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. It seems that most spiritual traditions, religions, what have you, wisdom paths, all begin with typically one person having what is called the religious experience, the mystical experience that, you know, there's so many terms for it, awakening, where suddenly, spontaneously, unexpectedly, they're transported out of their everyday kind of contracted state of consciousness of this is who I am, I'm this person doing this, living this role, functioning in this way, to this blown wide open perspective of no barriers between what's being perceived and the perceiver and all of this. And um, I know when we spoke at our first interview, you mentioned having uh, an experience similar to that when you're sitting in your pickup truck years ago. Um, I had a similar experience in my youth after fighting uh, years of depression and suicidal ideation. And it seems like that is the impetus that starts the, the search for, well, what is this really about? And spiritual culture, in a way, capitalizes on that, right? It capitalizes on the fact that these experiences like that happen, and it tries to uh, market it or explain it in a way that then can be packaged and turned into a philosophy or a doctrine, dogma, or technique, all of that. But Experiences like that do happen. So I wanted to get your take on how do you think that kind of experience, that religious experience or that awakening experience fits into the totality of what we call human experience? Mm -hmm. Well, human beings are capable of, all, of a very wide range of experiences. And I've certainly had some uh, startling experiences of um, let's call it merger with all and everything where where you myself the ordinary myself recedes into the background let's say and you feel a kind of oneness i've had i had this one very startling experience many years ago but but now it's a rather common experience that i have and not really mind blowing anymore because i'm accustomed to it but, um, well, I thought you put this very well in, in, uh, in your book, your, uh, which book was it? I just I was just looking into it. I, I think it's the first one. Um, I, ha I'm, I haven't really had time to read all your books. They're worth reading, but I have so much to read these days. And most of it's not about this theme at all. I'm very interested in science right now. But um, you compared this kind of awakening experience to an orgasm. And I thought that was a very useful analogy. Because you can't keep having an orgasm all day and night. Um, there's no way to function, even if there were some way to keep that 
state of mind going. I, I don't think there is, but even if there were, it wouldn't be very useful to live that way. And the other aspect of it is, okay, you had the orgasm and that's beautiful and everything, but if you met someone who had never had an orgasm and tried to describe that to that person, they wouldn't really be able to understand it. They might understand the words, but they wouldn't, that wouldn't give them the experience. And that is really my critique of all this spiritual teaching. The teacher sits there on a throne and describes how wonderful it is to be enlightened and all the rest of it. And the miserable people in the audience aspire to that, but the words of that teacher cannot provide it for them, at least not the way I see it. Yeah, and I would add further that even if, arguably, even if it was possible for a person to live in a state of pure orgasm all the time, I don't know if that would be desirable, but even if, and they were somehow uh, able to function. My broader point is, so what? If that's not what my experience is right now or somebody else's experience is right now, then it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if Elon Musk has you know, $285 billion and I will never know what it's like to live in Elon Musk's shoes and he will never know what it's like to live in mine, right? My life is my own experience and that's what I have to honor and that, that's kind of the only focus I can honor. And it seems that the entire industry is orientated around trying to manufacture an ideal state and that is placed on a pedestal over this ordinary eating, shitting, fucking, doing the taxes life that the vast majority of people have. Because it's not sensational, I feel. So how do you, how do you make something that's so unsensational appeal to somebody? How, how do you sell someone's normal life back to them? You know, that, that's always been the challenge for me, and I'm wondering how you approach that. Uh, mm -hmm. Well, uh, you call it an industry, and that's a very strange way to look at it, although a common way to look at it. Um, in a capitalist society, such as the U.S., everything is organized around corporate welfare, and making a buck. And this topic that we're discussing does not lend itself in any way to being marketed. What is marketed is bullshit. Bullshit. Because the teachers do not speak honestly about their human experience of waking up in the morning and needing to face the day. They refuse to do it because they have no particular expertise in doing that. And reading the Bhagavad Gita will not give you any expertise in how to do that, how to maintain an ordinary life, how to be a lover, husband, father, an employee or an employer. None of that can be learned from a spiritual teacher. They have no, they have no expertise. If they did know about those things, they might not need to be a spiritual teacher to make a living. John Troy and I have discussed this in detail because he is an entrepreneur and an expert in branding. And he pointed out to me all the many cases of how branding is accomplished in the spirituality industry. And I have no interest in that at all. Um, I'm an old guy. Um, I feel good about life and about myself and the people I know, and I'm just looking at sharing that. Yes, some of that is a so-called spiritual outlook because that's part of life, but it's not all of life. The most important thing is to get, get up in the morning and, and live, not have your head in seeking some kind of transcendent experience, because as you just pointed out, even if you had that experience, and even if you could keep that experience going on, which I don't think we can, but even if you could, so what? Is that, do you want to actually spend your life in a perpetual orgasm? I know I don't. 
So, Robert, why do you think it is that there's so few of us speaking in this way? Because, you know, often I'll get pushed back from um, other spiritual teachers and saying, you know, I'm, I'm not a, an opportunistic kind of person. I'm, I'm a, an honest, you know, good everyday human being. I'm not a psychopath trying to like exploit and fuck my followers and all of that. And to a large extent, that's true. Not everybody in the industry is sociopathic. There's obviously a, a large set of them because they thrive in this in this industry. But there are many well-meaning teachers out there, however, operating in this disingenuous sort of way because the culture fosters that, right? They, it rewards that behavior. So inadvertently, unless someone has a very strong spine and a clear moral compass, that ambiguity allows people over time to gravitate towards becoming increasingly disingenuous over time. I wanted to ask you why it is you think that there's so few people in the industry writing in the way you and I do. Because I'm sure people suspect that there's something rotten, something stinks, and yet they're going along with it. Mm -hmm. Well, you're calling it an industry. So I don't think that um, speaking the truth is compatible with being a member of an industry. It's, there, it, it's like, if I, uh, this is hard to put into words, but I will attempt to do it. The facts of life are really difficult. The facts of human primate existence are really difficult. The Buddha pointed this out 2,500 years ago, um, life is brief and usually ends with old age, suffering, and death. And there's really um, not much more we can say about this existence here. Yes, there are pleasures and joys and all kinds of things, but um, one of the spiritual writers, I, I, I can't recall who, said that human life is like setting sail in a boat that's going to sink. Now, people don't really want to hear that. They want to hear that there's some way to live eternally and never die. And that's the basis of the spirituality industry, as you call it. It's a promise that can't be fulfilled. So the people who are doing it, they may believe in what they're saying because they had a spiritual teacher at one time and were hypnotized by that person. Because what we, contemporary spirituality for the most part is a hypnotic trance. The teachers are the hypnotists. Um, I used to name them and point out their hypnotic te techniques because I, I, I have studied hypnotism, but I don't really like to name them anymore. Um, I did it to clear the ground when I first started speaking this way, and I think I got that part of it done. So now I'll just speak in general. But in general, if somebody offers you a satsang, what are they really offering you? They're offering you their opinion, which they call truth. And if you want to pay to hear that, I feel sorry for you. Yes, I've often said, Opinion parading is truth. That's all it is. Even the even the Buddha's words, or you know, um, Adi Shankara, who started uh, Advaita, all of these were just philosophers with opinions. Maybe um, you know, educated opinions or opinions that they cultivated after a lot of reflection, but opinions at the end of the day, right? Um, I wanted to come back to to something you were saying about studying the hypnotic techniques of the hypnosis that's kind of built into the way um, spiritual teachers communicate to their followers. Um, without naming names, can you talk us through some of the techniques that you've seen out there? Yeah, sure. Listen to me. Just give me your full attention. Just listen. Listen to what I'm saying. 
the material world is an illusion. It doesn't really exist. And you don't really exist. And I can show you how to verify that for yourself if you just listen to me and I will explain it to you. And when I'm finished explaining, you will get it. And if you don't get it this time, you'll come back to the next seminar and you'll get it there. And by the way, the seminar will cost you such and such, but it's worth it because this is eternal life I'm promising you, et cetera. And that's how it goes. It's a claim that cannot be fulfilled. So have you, you know, encountered people who accuse you of nihilism? or having a nihilistic philosophy of life, because that's something I come up against quite often in my writings, because I'm very much of a similar mindset as you. I I'll often use the analogy of life is jumping out of a plane without a parachute, and your experience of living is free falling until splat, you hit the ground and it's done. Um, and people see that as a life-denying philosophy, and they want to hear something life-affirming, because naturally they're struggling through life and they want something to inspire them to forge on ahead. And what I try to explain is that it may sound nihilistic, but it's actually life affirming to the max. Because when you, when you subtract all the detours and escape hatches that a person has available to them, then they're forced to turn nowhere but to the moment and face their life as it exists. And yes, we are free falling. But free falling for a large extent of your lifetime can feel like flying. And that's essentially what people want is the, is, is the freedom of flight in their life. Um, how do you deal with that kind of criticism that you are, have a nihilistic, life-denying philosophy that, that doesn't believe in anything other than sickness, old age, and death, as you mentioned? Uh -huh. Yes, well... I don't think there's anything nihilistic about what I'm saying. What I'm saying is if you remove the delusions and false promises, then you find yourself here. And to be here is the opposite of being nihilistic. What you're saying is I've been given this brief gift of awareness. It's not going to last forever. At best, it's going to last 80 years, 90 years, whatever it is. And the back end of that probably won't be terribly pleasant because there'll be a lot of pain and suffering that younger people don't really deal with for so frequently, some do. So if we look at the course of life, it's not nihilistic to say that life ends at a certain point for each of us and this gift of awareness that we now enjoy and even though I'm old and in some pain, I am enjoying it to the max, as you said. I'm enjoying it to the max. It's great to be here and be alive. I don't think there's anything nihilistic about that. All I'm saying is that comes to an end, and you're not going to be in heaven with Jesus when it's over, in my view, in my opinion, nor will you transcend this and become one with um, Brahman. That's not the story. Those are delusions that people use to deal with the fear of not being at all, which is a primal fear. It's not a decision to have that fear. We do have that fear. Most of what we do in life is a way of substantiating ourselves and showing ourselves that we actually exist. I mean, if we didn't need that, when people like you and and, and I wrote books, we wouldn't have our names on the cover. Why do we need that? Just put the title of the book on there and people can read it if they like. No, of course not. We human beings substantiate ourselves in everything we do. We have marriages, we have children, we have careers. This is all to enable the idea of myself to continue forward into the future. And we play at that game all our lives, but it doesn't continue into the future. Even the famous people, shortly after their death, they may have a upsurge of interest, but after a while that wanes and we need new stars and new role models. And that's just the way it is. 
Anybody can be replaced. And when you die, it's burial at sea. They toss your corpse over the side and the ship sails on because life is for the living. Now, I don't think that's nihilistic. I think it's realistic. What do you think? Yeah, I mean, that that has been very much in line with what I've, you know, written about in my books, as you're aware that, to me, I'm not interested in optimism, nor am I pessimistic in my approach. My, my approach is to evaluate reality the best way I can. And the only reality I know of is the one that's in front of me. I don't know what's going to happen when I die and, you know, whether there's anything that continues beyond there, I suspect not, but even if it were, were to, or what's happened in the past, even it's not much of my concern. Reality, as I know it, is what is happening in this moment. It's what's happening now. And that's my only relationship that I kind of am focused on. Obviously, there's a history to my life. And then there's some story making that happens around that through the memories and you know, it, it, it says a lot about me when I look at how I remember things. There are certain memories that, that linger and there are certain memories that don't. Uh, if you ask me you know, what I ate for dinner three nights ago, I couldn't tell you. But I could tell you what happened on a particular day when I was in the fourth grade when somebody bullied me. Little things like that, right? And those traumas and those memories linger. And, and we tend to build our stories around those significant events that happened in our lives, ignoring everything else that happened because it, it doesn't stand out for us. So there's a part of that that feeds into the personality. But at the same time, I know that a lot of that is based on prejudice and bias. And I have hundreds of cognitive biases. Everybody else does. Um, and that's not necessarily reality as well. So my there's a constant negotiation going on between the personality who wants to remember things a certain way and reality. And you can't argue with reality. Reality is what it is. Uh, and we may not understand it, but we can encounter it. And that's usually the basis by which I tend to operate. So um, whenever there's a conflict between my personality and reality, eventually I defer to reality because I know that's far more constant than my personality is. Obviously, it's always in flux as well, but there's something enduring about it. There's this sense of being in reality, the is this, for lack of a better word. And then within myself as well, there's a deep sense of being that's beyond my thoughts and my emotions. Those keep fluttering in and out, but there's this constant thread of being. And there, there's a relationship between the two. They're almost the same thing. In certain moments, they feel like the same thing. They don't feel like they're two different things. So I feel like human beings need some reference to that in order to develop perspective on themselves. What's your opinion on that? Um, well, I think I'm in a kind of unusual condition. Not... Um, not unheard of, but unusual in the sense that I'm not trying to make anything happen. Um, I'm just living right now in this moment. I'm speaking with you now. I have no other agenda at the moment. I don't need to. I can just do this. And I don't care about my personality. I don't need to do anything about it. It just is what it is. I have the interests that I have. Some of them are learned and some I was born with. I was a very curious child, for example, while another child might be incurious. That's personality, but it's inborn. It's not something that is created by the individual. And all of these questions that seem to engage people so deeply, um, I don't have any answers for them, and I don't need any answers. So what I see as a spiritual delusion is the idea that you're going to get an answer to those questions. If you ask a question that has no 
answer. You'll get lots of answers, but there'll be bullshit because that is the spiritual industry, as you called it. It's, it's a way of supplying answers to questions that don't have any answers. I'll just give one brief example. Some people say that the human being doesn't really exist as a center of awareness, that consciousness comes from the outside, that the universe is conscious, everything is conscious, every particle in the universe is conscious. And that when we see that, then we are spiritually realized. And that it, then, then we have transcended the human condition. We understand that our, our true nature is infinite consciousness. I hear this all the time. That it could be, that's possible, but where's the evidence for it? I don't, I don't really see much. I see a lot of evidence for naturalism. For example, I'm a primate animal and was born with an intelligence that evolved from the most primitive one-celled beings through about three and a half billion years and arrived at Robert and all the rest of us human primate animals. To me, that is much more likely to be factual than this idea that uh, no one really exists and we're just all objects in consciousness. There's no really, somebody just told me this, there's material objects don't really exist unless we're conscious of them. And I said to this person, you mean if you're not conscious of the moon in the sky, there is no moon? Yes, this person said, that's right. Well, is it? Is it really? How could somebody really make herself believe that? How? On what basis? Because the spiritual teacher preached it or the, some spiritual text that was just written by people after all says it. And I think the, the space that I have here in this conversation, I don't mean the conversation with you, I mean the wider conversation that you and I are both involved in. The space that, that I inhabit there is skepticism. And I think if we are not, if we ever lose skepticism, we're really lost. Now, a lot of people want to make themselves believe things. They need to believe things that can't be demonstrated. And my situation is that I find myself without that need. I have no need in concluding on any questions about ultimate metaphysics because I don't think those questions have answers. And since they don't, I just ignore them. They're meaningless to me. Some people I understand can't be that way. I don't blame them. We're all the way we are. I didn't ask to be this way. And so they want to spend their lives discussing these things. How many angels can stand on the head of it, on the point of a needle? But I just don't have any interest in that, Shiv. Yeah, th I, there was a point in my life when there were two of me. There was me and there was the idea of me and it was there, there was a perpetual tension between the two and a desire and a need and a seeking for reconciliation um that's not the case for me anymore for me it's everything is now driven by curiosity curiosity of the world curiosity of the genetic makeup of my body curiosity of the psychological makeup of my mind and I'm no longer involved in that perpetual process of self-management that I call, that most people are involved in, where they're perpetually trying to tweak something about themselves because something doesn't feel right or aligned with what's going on and they need to change something about that. Mine is more a curiosity about or a fascination of, wow, that's how this functions, or wow, that, that was an unexpected reaction. I wonder what that was about. Um, so I observe myself almost scientifically, uh, as one might observe a personality under a microscope in, in a lab, just trying to learn about how this strange thing functions. 
Um, similarly with reality, and I'd like to play a little bit of devil's advocate with you, because I agree with you that most of these, you know, spiritual doctrines about metaphysics, especially of the metaphysical kind, 99% of them are pure and total crap, bullshit, just stuff handed down through the centuries and, and distorted in various ways to people's agendas. However, if we look at it more academically, there have been many philosophers to argue for a what's known as a simulation hypothesis that perhaps, you know, this reality in a sense is a simulation of a kind um, by a technologically advanced civilization that developed an AI and was able to augment a reality that they, that they could then inhabit, similar to the way our society seems to be moving now towards more and more augmented and virtual type realities. So the philosophical argument is that what if it's already happened? And, and I can't remember, maybe you might know the philosopher who made those three postulates. And one of those points was that if a, a, a civilization could advance technologically enough to create a virtual reality, it would then want to inhabit that reality, is the, is the postulate, the first postulate. And the second one says that if that is possible, then it is most likely that, it, that it's already happened. Um, what are your thoughts on that kind of line of thinking, that if this were a simulation, then within the parameters of the simulation, there would be no way to truly empirically or scientifically test if we're living in a sim simulation because those parameters belong to the black box that is the simulation. Uh -huh. Yeah, so that was Nick Bostrom. That's who, right. Thank yeah, you. yeah, sure. He, he, um, <laughs> he cooked up these three postulates and used them to demonstrate logically that the odds are that we are living in a simulation. And human nature is so interesting. After he did that, people started walking around looking for places where the, where the simulation wasn't perfect. They would find a little seam in the sky, they thought, or a building didn't have the back edges intact or whatever it was, like, like, a, you know, like a Hollywood set. Or the glitch, the glitch in the matrix, basically. Yeah, Don't look for the glitch in the matrix. <laughs> that's the, that's the one. So you, I gave you Bostrom, and you gave me the glitch in the in the matrix. That's what, that's what we older people have to do. We have to help each other <laughs> to, get, to get through this. Right. Yeah. Well, you know, I I want to uh, your your publisher, Catherine, and mine. Um, wrote wrote an introduction to depending on nothing, and um, I've got a couple of lines from it that I want to read because it it um, encapsulates my my approach to this entirely. So mm -hmm. I'm grateful to Catherine for coming up with this, and I'll just read it. Honesty about not knowing is, in my experience, where equanimity is to be found. What we actually know is precious little, so many of us fill the apparent emptiness by pretending that believing is the same as knowing. When one believes without actually knowing, then there is always lingering doubt to deal with, even if only unconsciously, and there is never peace in the struggle between belief and doubt. So Catherine quoted me there. That's those lines are from depending on nothing. And that's the way I see it. The, the, the impetus behind a lot of a lot of the spirituality, and even Nick Bostrom, for example, is to somehow find a way to rationalize being here as a frail human primate animal. And the way that most people approach that is to have a set of beliefs. It might be a Christian, might be a Scientologist, or, or might be a nihilist, or optimistic, or anything. It's, it's a way of clinging to an explanation for 
what all this suffering is about. Why, why, why is it so hard to be alive? And it is. It is hard to be alive. I think most of us, if we're honest, will admit that, that life is tough. It can be cold. It can be difficult. Even if we're fortunate, it can be difficult. And if we're unfortunate in our health, in our physical endowments, in the course that our lives take, if we're unfortunate that way, this can be a hell. So of course people want to es escape from it and find equanimity. And what I'm saying is equanimity, in my experience, occurs when you stop trying to get out of this moment and just live from moment to moment without great expectations and just take things as they come and deal with them moment by moment, step by step. And that will be a life that will not be transcendental, of course, but it will be a real human life in the way that I see it, Shiv. I've received um, a lot of criticism when, when talking about this space of not knowing being kind of the most honest space a person can be in. And some of the criticism sur surrounds the, the argument that are you promoting a sense, uh, a culture of ignorance? Are you saying that you no know, people need no longer uh, validate scientific facts or, or the fact that, you know, the speed of light is 3.8 uh, to 10 to the power of uh, minus 19 meters per second or whatever it is, sorry, 19 meters per second. Um, basic facts that we know about the world, well, then the argument can be made, well, how do we know these things? And, and does a person then just sort of embrace absolute ignorance and lose all curiosity for life? And there has been pushback of that kind when people have, you know, since misunderstood and misinterpreted what this pointer of not knowing is about. So how do you usually, if I'm not sure if you've encountered that kind of criticism, but what do you do if and when you do? Well, th this, is, this is the question of what's called epistemology, which means what do we know and how can it be known? What can be known and how can it be known? And at one end of the spectrum, you can say nobody can really know anything because uh, all we know is our perceptions, feelings, and thoughts, and we, we could be completely deluded. That's one end of the spectrum. The other end of the spectrum is I'm absolutely 100% certain that Jesus died for my sins. 100% certain. And there are a lot of people who claim to be that certain. I think a lot of the ones who claim it aren't, but some of them undoubtedly are. There's a point on that spectrum that can make sense. And I'm in, in that area of the spectrum. And this is, yes, possibly nothing can truly be known beyond the shadow of a doubt, except that I seem to exist. That's hard to deny that I, as a center of awareness, seem to exist. Seem, not that I do exist. That's hard to deny. But I think there's plenty of area in that spectrum where you could be fairly sure that something is true. For example, I'm fairly sure that the moon exists. I see it in the sky at night. People have landed on it and walked around on it. And I think it's very hard to deny that that does not really exist. And I don't see any reason why anyone would want to. I don't see any reason for denying that the material world is real or that Robert Saltzman is not real. It's all real in, in my view of the material world. But real does not, be, okay, step back. I criticize Vedanta. One reason that I criticize it is that one of its aspects is the claim that nothing that changes is real, only the unchanging substrate of all of this is real. The ocean is real, as this would be said, but the waves are not real. They're just more ocean. Well, is that true? I don't know. 
I don't know if there is a substrate to all of this. This could just be what it is without any background to it, without any noumenon uh, causing or creating the phenomenon that, that we see all around us, the phenomena that we see all around us. This is uh, a platonic view. When Plato thought there were ideal forms and that, for example, there's an ideal Robert Saltzman, and this, what we see here, is a shadow of that ideal. It's possible. A lot of people are interested in that idea. But as I said, I don't have a great deal of interest in ideas that cannot be demonstrated. So I'm more into the nuts and bolts of things. I like to work in gardens. I like to tame animals. I like to be married and have a household with a woman. These are the things that to me are real. And the philosophical basis for all that can be interesting at times, but it's not something that grips me. It's not my major uh, um, pursuit in life, not at all. I like to wake up in the morning and just get into the day and live it. Yes, there was a time in my life when I was interested in these questions and read a lot of books about science and philosophy and psychology and spirituality and tried to put that all together into a, an understanding. And probably it was helpful to, to have that time in my life. So I'm not discouraging people from seeking answers to their questions. What I am pointing out is that in my opinion, in my experience, when the questions have been put to rest, not because they're answered, but because you see that they cannot be answered, then you're in, you find yourself in an equanimous place. And I think people are attracted to my work because when they hear me speak about these things, they see equanimity. This is equanimity. I don't need to convince anybody of anything. I'm just going to say how I see it, just as you are, just as John Troy is, just as Catherine Noyce is doing, or Joan Tollefson, who are people who are interested in spirituality without getting caught up in it, without getting lost in it. And I, I, I'm glad we're having this conversation because I think you're someone who speaks quite accurately. Not that everything you say is true, I don't know that, but what you, a lot of what you do say can be applied usefully to this human situation in which we find ourselves, Shiv. I've, I find that the odds are almost stacked against people because this platonic view, as you called it, this, this view of there being an ideal state to aspire to, pretty much what drives Western society today. It's, it's pervasive in every aspect of our lives. It's every, every corporation is trying to grow perpetually towards a, an increasingly ideal state. The economies are doing that. Uh, the culture is, of self-improvement is set up for that. Everyone has an idea of where they want to get to financially, emotionally, spiritually, all of that. And it's this hamster wheel that keeps everything moving it's i i call uh, i call this a sense of lack the most reliable non uh, most reliable renewable resource on the planet uh, even more than solar energy or wind energy if you can tap into human lack i mean you can fuel whatever industry you want forever and uh, and that was a, a marketing strategy that edward bernays who was sigmund freud's nephew pursued in the early 1920s. And that was a big pivot in modern marketing, where they moved away from appealing to the rational side brain of the customer, which said, you know, Ford truck, X many horse, horsepower, it does this, is reliable, all of that, to guy driving a Ford truck with a beautiful woman on his side and, uh, you know, caption saying this, buy Ford, this is what freedom feels like. And um, Edward Bernays knew based on his uncle's philosophy, that if you appeal to the rational mind of a customer, you'll probably get a little bit of mileage out of them. But if you appeal to the unconscious, that deep sense of lack and insecurity, you can keep 
mining that emotion forever, essentially. And it was so successful that it, I feel like the entire uh, structure of society is now orientated around that and, and pretty much any industry, including the spiritual industry. So what would you, how do you advise somebody who clearly wants to be able to function in a pragmatic way, where they're encountering each day, living within the practical reality of the moment, not getting lost in idealism. How does that kind of person reconcile against the entire culture around them that's geared for that, that rewards that, no matter what your job is or who you employ or what your industry is? They're, they're seeking that in the people they're looking to promote. How does a person short of going off grid and off into the woods and creating their own little bubble of sanity function within that sort of an insane setup? Yeah, well, it's very difficult because we're all deeply conditioned. We come into the world as babies and for the first few years of our lives, we believe everything we're told by our caregivers. There's no cool there's no critical um, intelligence there at all. It usually arrives later, maybe at the age of six or seven, we begin to become aware that the people around us are not always speaking honestly and that they have agendas of their own. Eventually, sadly, we may even realize that everything that can be corrupted has been corrupted. This advertising that you're talking about is a form of corruption. Instead of giving information, the idea is to influence someone by appealing to them on the psychosexual level. And the advertising industry, which you just evoked, has um, studied that to the point where they're experts. And we're all living in a society in which the individual is not respected, but we're just seen as animals who need to be led to the slaughter. And that's how the, the, the uh, wealthy entrepreneurs pay for their corrupted lifestyle. And those lifestyle is corrupted. They'll take a private jet, burn enough fuel to actually transport hundreds of people just on a 20-minute flight because they want to. Um, that's just an example. Industry is corrupt. Every, every little niche where someone can make even one penny will be occupied by someone who's in it as a racket. Now, it's very hard for anyone to exist outside of that situation anymore. There was a time in prehistory, not prehistory, excuse me, but there was a time historically on this planet when people were not corrupted that way. They would work on their farms, they would fish, they would do what they needed to do to survive. And there wasn't any mass marketing and group mind and Facebook and all the rest of it. But now you ask, how would I advise someone? That's a really difficult question. In general, I would say, try to separate everything you believe and set it aside and say, I don't know why I came to believe those things. I'm going to set them aside and try to find my own mind as, as pure a mind as I can find. And then I'll find out what I want and need and not what I'm being told, but not what I am being told I should want or that I do need. And you mentioned the spirituality industry several times. It shouldn't be an industry. What I'm doing now, I'm just giving this away. I'm not looking to make a profit out of this conversation, and I won't make a profit out of this conversation. I'm not charging anybody for anything. Yes, I have a couple of books out, and I get a couple of bucks when one is sold, but that's, that, that's minor. 
and the books need to be sold. Publishers need to make money. That's their in business. If you have a good publisher, like the one we both have, the books that they publish will be interesting books and books that that were published in the right spirit. If another publisher wants to sell a bunch of pornography and everything because they can make a buck doing that, well, then they'll do that. It's up to the individual to the extent possible to try to find one's own mind and be less manipulated by people who want to own your mind for profit. It's so the advice is don't let people sell your own mind back to you by telling you what they think you need. Find out what you need. And it might be something really simple. I know in my case, it really is simple. I just want to be at peace. Simple as that. I want to wake up in the morning and say, here I am. It's another day. I won't always be here. And I'm going to enjoy what I can and deal with the rest as best I can, Jib. It's interesting, the words um, culture and cult have, are, share the same etymology and they, and they derive from, from the, the original meaning, the, the Latin meaning being cultivate, to cultivate. And, and when you look at the act of cultivation, growing crops, plants are grown in a very controlled environment, given adequate sunlight, adequate water, adequate space, so that they can be used in a certain way, so that they can be manipulated and used for a certain purpose. And what culture does with human beings is essentially the same thing. We're, we, we've, we're enculturated to believe that society has our best interests in mind, but really it wants something out of us. We're being groomed for a certain purpose and a purpose we may not be evident to us, but a purpose that exists. And this is something that I often will point out when I write, when people say, oh, you're such a uh, critic of spiritual culture. And I say, well, no, I'm actually not a critic of just spiritual culture. I'm a critic of all cultures because essentially what any form of culture does is create a format for being, for existence, and then requires its members to follow that format. And you can see it in fashion culture, political culture, all forms of culture. And, and there's an interesting anecdote I'd like to share with you. It's, you know, I've spent many years living in Japan, uh, eight years, close to a decade. And that's a highly conformist society, right? But people tend to follow the rules, very law-abiding and all of that. Well, there exists a subculture within um, Japanese society called the uh, Bosakozu. And the Bosakozu are these rebel motorcycle gangs uh, that ride around making a hell of a racket everywhere they go. They wear the old, um, they, they carry the old imperial uh, flag of Japan with the sun and its uh, rays coming out of it. And you can find them in the big cities of uh, you know, Tokyo, Osaka, and things like that. And, and they kind of pride themselves of living outside the norms of society and being anti-establishment and all of that. Well, what's really interesting about the Bosakozu culture is that they all dress the same way. They all have the same kinds of bikes. They, they use the same kind of language and they show up at the same times and congregate and behave in a very conformist way with, within that subculture. And so it's interesting to me that every time there is some kind of uprising against the dominant culture, whether that be a political revolution or some kind of a spiritual uh, new way of uh, talking or thinking or criticizing what is the dominant culture, eventually over time, that becomes a culture of its own. And we've seen that with Buddhism, which you know, the Buddha's teachings, as pragmatic as they were 2000 years ago, 2,500 years ago, have completely turned into something else, right? If you especially go into Southeast Asia and you see the forms of Buddhism practice there, or in Japan with Pure Land Buddhism, right? it's very similar to Christianity, really. So I want you to comment on that if you can, 
about how culture forms, the genesis of culture, even if it starts from a very original place, how it distorts over time. So that's um, a funny image of the Japanese Hell's Angels. So that's, that's, that's tribalism. Um, it feels good to be a member of a group and to be accepted and to be seen and to have a home to go to and all of this. Um, the problem with being a member of a group is then you are infected with the group mind. And the group mind um, may not be the best approach to living, probably isn't. Um, I'm much more interested in individuality. I want to know what I see, what I think, what I care about, and not have that explained to me by some authority figure. And so, as you point out, in Japan, these people are rebels, and yet when they form a group, they become um, subjected to the group mind. Um, many people in contemporary culture want to be a member of a tribe actively they want to people will say i want to find my tribe i want to find my tribe and one example of tribalism that's going on right now uh, joan tollison and i have been discussing this now for several months i think productively i like hearing from her she's a good friend um one example is the uh, transsexual movement, which I think began, I, sh I should say at the outset that I'm not a, a critic of transsexuality in any sense. In fact, I have two transsexual people in my life that I love very much. One is recently deceased, but I have, I, I, I had him for many years. And my other transsexual friend is still living and doing well and I, I love her so this is not a critique of transsexuals it's a critique of this tribalism that has established certain boundaries for what can be said and how and if someone violates those boundaries that person is punished by the by this tribe so this tribe is a nasty manifestation of stupidity, which makes all kinds of claims that cannot be backed up. For example, that sex is not binary. It certainly is binary. People are male or female when they're born. Yes, there's a tiny percentage, a small fraction of 1% of people whose genitals or, or uh, DNA might not be clearly male or female, but that's tiny. For the most part, people don't have a sex that they were assigned at birth, which is nasty language. They have the sexual, they have the sex that with which they were born. If I say that now, I am considered an enemy of transsexuals, and I'm not. I'm not an enemy of transsexuals because I say that a child of six or seven can't be trans. They don't know who they are yet. They must be allowed to live longer and find out who they are. But no, we want to take the word of a six-year-old child about what medical interventions are necessary. It's insane. And if I point that out, I, I am pointing it out right now, and I'll probably get some hate mail when you put this thing on the internet. That's how it goes, just like you got this big pushback for this last article that, that of yours that I read. I, I laughed. I thought it was really funny because the same thing has happened to me. And the, the, your critics are so stupid, and I guess you must feel that way about them, do you? Uh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, 
I'm open to criticism. I always encouraged it, but the, the criticism has to arise from a rational place where we can then further dis the discussion. But when there's a shutting down of oh, this this sounds disgusting to me, then obviously you know there's there's no intelligence there. It's just a purely emotional and reactionary response. And to your point, Robert, it's not just six and seven year olds. And in fact. Uh, where I live in Canada now, and especially in the province of British Columbia, which seems to be at the forefront of this kind of um, identity politics, it's being mandated down to the daycare level where daycare uh, teachers are not allowed to address children as young as two and three by their gender, uh, by, their sec by their sex, biological sex. They're not allowed to refer to a boy as a he or a girl as a she because that would be them assuming the child's gender and the child's gender is still up for debate and you know that's become the policy the public policy in place but i see that all of this manifesting as part of a, a wider problem which we actually touched upon earlier where this is just an example of that platonic ideal on crack where now we have an entire generation and driven by a lot of political investment, uh, the entire political establishment asserting that the ideal only is true and that the fact of your life is actually entirely ambiguous. It's very bizarre, but that's the underlying assumption. That's what allows all of this rhetoric to fuel is them saying, look, you're saying biological sex is binary. What I'm saying is it's not even real. What's real is what I feel about myself, and that is the social construct of gender. And that only should be considered, and we should completely neglect any facts of birth. They're just inconvenient facts that we want to sweep under the carpet. And that's a very dangerous, slippery slope to embark on because Where's the line in the sand then? Where do we where do we say reality actually begins? Does it just begin in what I want to say about myself? Yeah, that, that's a great analysis. <laughs> that's about the um, platonic ideals being being uh, embraced and the individuality being swept under the carpet. So I do think gender is fluid and I, of course it is, and we all know that. Um, and so is sexuality. I mean, homosexuality is, is a fact. There's nothing wrong with it. It's just one manifestation of human sexuality. And I certainly can understand how someone who was born in a male body could want to have the gender role that's more like what women have. There's nothing really wrong with that, in my view. What's wrong with that, in my view, in my opinion, is to distort biology entirely so that you can have your feelings about what you are. It's madness. In my opinion, and I, this is a very strongly held opinion, I must say, a woman is a mature human female. She was a girl, and then she became a woman. Now, when she was a girl, if she said, if she says, I don't really feel like a girl, I feel like a boy, okay, that's understandable. And the more that, that culture divides the way that the two sexes are permitted to express their humanity, the more compelling it might feel to redefine oneself in a gender role. That sounds complex. Let me break it down a little. If I'm a tomboy, let's say, in a more rational society, there wouldn't be any problem with being a girl, but doing things that boys like to do or dress like a boy and grow up to do the kinds of things that men are allowed to do that women are not allowed to do. That was a culture that I grew up in. There was a very 
a very uh, defined, well-defined split between male roles and female roles. That's disappearing now. And I think that if it really disappeared entirely, there would not be this need to change bodies so much. Um, which I find bizarre. All of this, all of this uh, sexuality to me, to me is, is really sad. Um, and um, well, now I've really put my foot in it. So I'm, <laughs> now, now I'm expecting, I, you know, I've gone on about this because to me, this is one of the basic issues um, that mitigates against intelligence. People are being forced to, on, on, in public to act stupider than they really are because if they really express what they know and feel in, them, in themselves, they might lose their position in society. Well, it's bizarre to me that, that anything such as a taboo subject exists anymore. And there's, there's actually plenty of them. They're, they're proliferating every day. And I think you and I are just wanting to as two curious intellectual individuals talk about something. It doesn't mean you're right or I'm right, but why should we not be allowed to discuss it in fear that it might offend somebody or we might get blowback for expressing a point of view? It's that that is truly dystopian to me that that's even a consideration anymore, right? But I'm very much of the mindset that you are, Robert, in that bizarrely, and I don't know if people see this, that this very discussion about changing genders reinforces those gender stereotypes. It, it assumes that there is something that it means to be a man, and that is something that it means to be a woman. And so perhaps, you know, someone who's born in a female body who exhibits traits of dominance and greater levels of regression and things like that might feel that there's an expectation of society that she be more agreeable and, and not uh, assert herself as much and things like that. And so she thought, well, well, you know, if I was if I was just a guy, then this would not be an issue. And, you know, similar to yourself, I have um, a few transsexual people in my life that I consider friends. And I've actually seen that change where the, a, a woman who's transitioned to a man now in this male form and really the transformation is incredible because you know there's the facial hair there's a change in the tone of voice and the mannerisms and all of that it's you know they are almost unrecognizable now to you know the way they presented a few years ago and they seem so much more comfortable in asserting themselves in that way because the way society responds to them is different now where they, they see a guy and guys will you know, approach them as as men approach other men, as opposed to how we might approach women. So there is clearly that prejudice still in society, that bias on how men are supposed to be and women are supposed to be. But to your point, we we as an enlightening society, we should be moving more towards breaking down those barriers, not reinforcing them, and then jerry rigging this whole setup to take care of people's sensitivities. Yeah, I, I agree. I think you said it very well. Um, and uh, yeah, I think you said it very well. I wanted to talk about uh, another phenomenon with you. And I think your perspective as a psychotherapist is going to be interesting in this one. And that is this whole culture around trauma counseling. Uh, trauma has turned into a buzzword, it seems, and become an industry of its own, in a sense. And I think there are some parallels and connections here between, you know, why it appeals as a theory and an approach and technique so much to the, this generation and some of the social phenomenon around transgender activism and things like that. I think there's a connection here between trauma and the way we are treating it. Um, I sat next to uh, Dr. Gabor Mate many years ago on a plane. I didn't know who he was at the time. And uh, we had a chat on the, on the topic. We talked a little bit about him and his background. And at the time, he was a you know, columnist for the Toronto Star. He 
He, he was still actively involved in working with addictions in Vancouver. Since then, he's really blown up into the celebrity type person. And, and I think a lot of that has to do with this large cultural shift towards you know, treating everybody as if they're traumatized and, and PTSD and, and wanting to work through that. And it becomes another carrot and a stick on a stick in my view. Just wanted to get your thoughts on that, Robert, and how you as a, you know, psychoanalyst, psychotherapist would look at that cultural phenomenon around trauma and why that doctrine of trauma appeals so much to people these days. Okay. Well, a, a trauma is a wound, but being wounded does not necessarily mean that one will suffer from post-traumatic stress disorder. The, the stress disorder is a reaction to the wound. And what a wound that might precipitate stress disorder in one person might have little or no effect on another. So this is really a very personal thing. And it has to be discuss personally in psychotherapy and not just assume that everyone has been traumatized. I mean, that's a silly idea in my view. Um, we were talking before about trauma in this, in, I, no, not trauma. We were talking before about, um, about the trance thing and the group mind. And in that group mind, we have now arrived at what is called a microaggression, a microaggression, where, for example, if I call you she instead of they, you have been traumatized, maybe only a little because it's a microaggression. But those microaggressions add up so that sooner or later you can identify as a victim. And as soon as you identify as a victim, now you have rights that you didn't have before. You have the rights to be treated in a certain way and to be regarded as someone who needs careful handling and careful attention and a nurturing environment and all of that. But I don't think humans are guaranteed a nurturing environment. We may want one, but we may not get one. And it's up to each individual human to try to deal with that and to try to make a culture in which no one is ever hurt or insulted or microaggressed against can't lead anywhere good, in my opinion. Chip. Yeah, I often will. will write about and talk to people about the fact that the expectation that life has to be a level playing field is a delusion of its own. Fundamentally, from a naturalistic perspective, we're in the jungle here. This is a jungle law. It's eat or be eaten, kill or be killed. And every organism is using its own strategy that it's evolved to survive. And now it turns out human beings the, the most successful strategy we've had has been the, the social strategy, the ability to build large structures beyond just tribes, um, entire nations, entire global populations that are all bonded together by a shared belief system or shared ideal. And so those beliefs have, in, in Alfred Korbzyski's um, phrase, he calls us time binders because we've been able to use these stories to link generations together, whereas animals don't do that. They just live very much in the moment. They don't know who their ancestors are. They don't care. They just live for this lifetime. Um, but in that process, we've lost that sense of, well, what is real in this moment? Because we've gotten so lost into the story of it. And I feel like trauma has become another story. And so similar to how once upon a time, you know, there were some very rudimentary laws in place to keep society going, which is, okay, just don't kill somebody else. And if you don't kill somebody else, 
you know, those, those are the bare, the, the bare morals we're going to function around, right? Don't, don't steal stuff. Don't kill somebody else. That's good enough. Then it became a more, uh, you know, don't, don't go and punch somebody in the face because then you'll go to jail for it. There's a physical act of aggression and physical acts of aggression are unlawful. Then that went more towards speech as in hate speech. Well, don't say things that could be perceived as an act of aggression. And so that whole mantra of sticks and stones may break your bones and words will never hurt me that once persisted in, in you know, people would, would echo no longer exists, right? The, the, the words can be more hurtful than, than physical acts of aggression. But it feels like we've now passed another threshold where now it's not just words, but thoughts can become physical acts of aggression. And I think that's where the idea of a microaggression comes in, is that even if you're thinking in a, an oppressive way or negatively or, or discriminatorily about somebody else, then that can be treated as a, uh, you know, a crime and will be dealt with punitively. And I can't remember where I heard this, but there, there's one of the podcasts, I think it's the Dark Horse podcast. Um, they were mentioning how one of the professors at um, a prominent university in the United States was called up uh, for a disciplinary hearing because he he responded to a, a, a trans person, or I think it was a person, trans person, a person of color walking into the room, and he raised his eyebrows. It happened to raise his eyebrows at that time. And that was perceived as a microaggression. And this professor was written up. So now we're, we're going into the realm of body language and facial expressions. We're not just talking about words. Where does that end? If, if you were to look into your crystal ball, this is just a, you know, uh, an accurate kind of intellectual exercise. If you were to look into your crystal ball and say, this is the trajectory society's on, where does it end? Does it, is there some way to get off that crazy train? Or do you think it's just kind of all headed towards some eventuality? Um, I think, hmm, let me just fix this. Okay, I think um, there are some signs that we're moving back more toward the center. Lately, I'm seeing that, but I don't really have a crystal ball. Reflecting on what you just said earlier, um, the, I the ideal injustice previously was equality of opportunity and that a just society would give everyone a fighting chance. That is changing now to equity, which doesn't mean equality of, of, uh, of opportunity, but equal outcome. And that's, that's just absurd on the face of it. Um, one woman is born beautiful and bright, and another woman is hard to look at. And to imagine that they, there's some way to give those people an equal outcome makes no sense at all. We are, after all, animals. We have our attractions and our repulsions. And we have ideals that go back in time that cannot be easily transcended, these ideals of beauty and intelligence and athleticism and such. And the people who have those attributes easily rise to the top of societies. They may need to make an effort, but if they make an effort, they will rise. Whereas somebody who does not have those attributes might try and try and really be brave in trying and won't get anywhere. So there is no equality of outcome. There's no equity that can be guaranteed. So when people look at a set of cultural arrangements and say that they're not equitable, I think they're barking up the wrong tree entirely. And yet that's, that's the current understanding in Western culture, particularly US culture. I should say, I, I don't live in the US, but I, I was born there. 
it's been more than 30 years since I lived there. But um, when I observe it, that is the epicenter of this stupidity. And I think the Europeans are moving away now from some of these ideas. They've seen through it in a way that um, the Americans have not. So. so I want to ask you, Robert, uh, what's what's on the horizon for you next? So you've written these two books that have been very well received by, by you know, a, a niche group of readers who are able to see through the smoke and mirrors of as we call the spiritual industry and everything it promotes, and, and they've seen great value in your books. Um, what's next for you? Are you planning to write any more? Are you kind of done with the whole writing thing? Are you still speaking to people? What's what's on the cards? Uh, well, I don't, I'm not feeling pregnant with any with any further books. I think I said it pretty well. In fact, the first book, is being read all over the world and I hear from people and, and it's been translated now into other, other languages. So I hear from, from readers all the time and I usually spend an hour or two in the morning doing correspondence and dealing with all of that. Um, but the rest of the day, I devote to myself and the things that I love to do, photography being one of them, working with animals, um, enjoying time with my wife, Catania. We're both retired now. We're living in a nice place, and it's just great to be here. I don't really feel that I have a lot more to give in this sense, although I could be wrong. But um, I think what I represent for a lot of people is simply a clear, a clear mind. And I believe that's true. And so, you know, I'm just enjoying having a clear mind. I won't be around that much longer anyway. I'm an old guy now. I'll be 78 on uh, Saturday. And um, it's, it's good to have arrived at, at self-understanding to the extent that one can relax and simply be, Chip. Well, you know what they say, 78's the new 58, so I'm sure you've got, still got some uh, time to go. But this has, been, uh, this has been a great conversation, Robert. It always is, uh, whenever we, we do meet and do have an opportunity to chat. And I think this is the third time we've done this. And I'd love to do uh, another one sometime with you and perhaps even Paul Jonan, who is a mutual friend and uh, whose, whose uh, perspective I value a lot. So, so we can chat about what that looks like soon. Well, yeah, thanks a lot, Chip. It's been great speaking with you. And if you ever can enlist Joan, I, a three-way would be great. I enjoy that. All right. Well, well thanks, just, Robert. Yeah, my pleasure. I just wish you well. I like what you do, so just keep it up. Thanks, Robert. Appreciate it.